Sure. Y'all get in tight. Y'all get in tight. Tight shot. Thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up. WIS? Good, okay. Jake? That's exhibit A right there. Good morning. I'm Brian Sterling. I'm the director of the South Carolina Department of Corrections. We're here to share some good news today. South Carolina has the lowest recidivism rate in the country at 21.9%. You can clap now. <laughs> recidivism is measured after inmates have time to rebuild their lives after release. If they remain out of prison for three years, they are considered a success. Last year, we were tied with Virginia. This year, we're even lower. We've got hard work to do here, and we've been doing hard work. When I first took over, the governor at the time told me that folks come to prison and leave. A lot of y'all who follow me on social media see the hashtag 85.5 and you. 85% of the folks that come to prison are out in under five years and they're back out amongst us in the community. So we want to make them better and give them the opportunities to better themselves and not come back to prison. And that's exactly what we're doing at the South Carolina Department of Corrections. Much to the credit to, of the folks standing up here, we've got our wardens over here. We have our cabinet agencies. We've got public-private partnerships. This is a Herculean effort by the state of South Carolina to make sure that people, when they come to prison, they don't return. When I first took over at the department, um, I went down to see the bus stop. A lot of y'all remember the Greyhound bus stop where we used to release the folks leaving prison. I wasn't really thrilled, as Ms. Staley can remember, I don't know where she is, but with what I saw. I saw people living, leaving in prison uniforms. All we did was take the stripe off, and they were just given a bag and a little bit of money and said, good luck. Now we have housing, employment opportunities, family support, documentation and services. Behind me, so that was in um, 2013, that was October of 2013. A year later, we created the first reentry program at Manning, brought, brought the folks here for a few months, six months, released them on, uh, with job skills, employment, work keys, documents, soft skills, how to interview, and a simple thing as how to explain incarceration, because we all know that's gonna come up. I was incarcerated, but this is what I did while I was incarcerated. I worked in PI, or I had a job as a plumber, or I had a job as a mechanic. That's what I did. The folks standing behind me are some of the Governor McMaster's agencies who have stepped up. Uh, do for the first in the country, we had a work center in a prison. So our department employee at workforce was in the prison. Ms. Richardson right there has been a key aspect of this. I've been helping people here at Manning. Uh, DMV, simple things is identification, driver's license. We know we can't function without those. Deotis for drug treatment. We got DHEC for birth certificates. We have SC Thrive, which helps us with benefits. Voc Rehab, Catholic Charities. Where's uh, Michael? There he is. Catholic Charities helps with housing because we know they're going to need housing when they leave. Um, in 2016, Ms. Staley, who was retired from SCDC, came. Now she's replaced by, where's Jake? Oh, there he is, okay. By Jake, um, who just became um, the deputy director, no longer interim, um, was renamed uh, Manning Reentry Center, because that's what we were doing here. A key component of this was what the General Assembly, we obviously need funding and resources to do this. The General Assembly has given us over the years 4.17 million for reentry. For every point we go down, we have 92 less people that come to us. So since 2010, we have gone down from about 33% to the 21.9%, um, the so about 11 uh, points. That's 92 people. For every 92 people, that's $6 million in taxpayer money. If we had 92 people over 10 years or 11 years, that would be another level two or level three prison. That would be a lot more people that we have here at the department. You're seeing the success of the public-private partnerships. You're seeing the success of the folks that are behind me. If you have a loved one that's incarcerated, please ask them to get involved in these programs. We have it at every level now. We've got a two-year reentry program 
at, for our level three, our maximum security folks, close custody folks. We have a program for our uh, medium custody folks, and we have one for our level ones. We are also doing uh, a change of where we house people. So there's going to be a lot more opportunities. We've changed our classification system, a lot more opportunities for, for jobs and things of that nature. We've got people that hire folks up here that are going to talk. If you're a business, please consider hiring someone. Please consider giving a second chance. This success is not based on what we're just doing here at SCDC. This success is the legislature, Governor McMaster with his support. We've got private industry. We also have sentencing reform. All those things have led us to be the, the most successful in reentry in the country. Now, Governor McMaster, if you'd like to say Thank a few you. words. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Rick Sterling. Well, this is a it's a it's a happy day in South Carolina, and we all love to at the end of the day to whether it's the mountains or the ocean or wherever we are looking out over the lake, wherever we happen to be, if we're fortunate enough to be in one of those places, to see the sun go down. But what we're seeing now is the sun's coming up, the sun's rising on South Carolina. Over the years, we've been first on a lot of great things, and this kind of vision that is reflected here today in all of these people, this great team that includes public, private, all across the board, represents the great strength of South Carolina. This takes vision, it takes understanding, and it takes a belief that there, there are some people who end up behind the, the wire that have gone off the road to prosperity, have fallen off, but that can get back on, that want to get back on if they're given the opportunity and the tools. I've always said that South Carolina's got talent. We watch these shows on TV, so-and-so's got talent. I believe South Carolina's got more talent than anybody. <laughs> but there's some that have lost their way that we can help. There's some that's very difficult to help, almost impossible. But there's some that we can and we ought to because we have a, a culture in our state. We have a, a nature, an understanding among the people, an understanding of life that has taken decades, uh, yea, centuries to develop. And it's very strong, and that's why employers that want to risk hundreds of millions and billions of dollars it could go anywhere in the world, and they're coming to South Carolina right now because of what you see here in this, in this room. So, Director Sterling, a big thank you. Congratulations on behalf of 5.2 proud, happy South Carolinians. Uh, we're going straight to the top, and we appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Dan Elsey. I'm the director of the Department of Employment and Workforce that Director Sterling uh, mentioned a few minutes ago. Mr. Governor, good morning. Director Sterling, good morning. Uh, I certainly want to congratulate you. I mean, this is a high honor. The lowest recidivism rate in the nation has got to be uh, the result of an incredible amount of work and great leadership, and I salute you for that. And I was I had no idea where we stood, and I was shocked and happy to see where we do stand. I think it's uh, absolutely great, and our agency is mighty happy to play a uh, small part in this. We've been involved with uh, our program is called Second Chance, where we start working with uh, inmates about 90 days before they get out. We have caseworkers who report to work in the prisons every day. That's where their offices are. And they work with uh, inmates, getting them ready to get out, getting them ready to get a job, working on resumes, letters to employers, how to explain incarceration, doing mock interviews and that sort of thing to help them as much as we can to uh, get out. During that time, well, we, we started Manning here in 2014, and then we went over to Camille uh, Griffin Graham, the women's facility in 2017. Uh, about 2,300 people have been through the program. Uh, and I'm happy to say that the success rate for people who got out, got a job, is 71%. 71%. <laughs> Now, being in workforce development, I can tell you that's a good number for people who are not coming out of prison. So it is a great number. And it just tells you, if you've got a caseworker working with you and you've got certain people, employers, willing to work with you, then uh, you've got a good chance of, uh, of success. Um, 
So our goal has been to get somebody ready to get a job when they get out. But our role is getting ready to change because of technology. We all learned a lot during the pandemic, and we learned how to do things virtually like we never thought we would learn how. And one of those is a virtual job fair, which we have rolled out across the state uh, right now. Every one of the local workforce areas has unlimited use of the platform. They can do 10 a day if they want to, if they got the employers and the job applicants to, uh, to support it. Well, we want to make the next step and bring it into Manning and Camille Griffin. And we want in inmates now not just to learn how to get a job, but we want them to get them interviews virtually, which we can do with this platform, so that many of them hopefully will have a job when they walk out the door. And I am certainly no expert on recidivism, I can assure you of that, but it does make common sense to me that if you got a job and a place to stay, your chances of staying out of trouble are probably pretty good. So that's a, uh, a new program we hope to get going as soon as we can figure out the tech, not, not the technology, but how, how to do it inside of the, uh, the prisons and not interfere with uh, the rules uh, in here. Uh, we do have a couple of other programs that we work with uh, to help people get a job, federal bonding for people left leaving here, we can give their employers free bonding in case they do relapse and do something wrong. Uh, we also have work opportunity uh, uh, tax credits where we will, the federal government, we run the program, but it's federal money, uh, reimburse employers for a percentage of the wages that they pay up to a maximum and based on the number of hours that a uh, uh, inmate, a released inmate works. Uh, last thing I want to mention are the employers. Uh, I guess about a month after getting into this job, which would have been about two years ago, I went to a job fair for people who had just been released. And I'm thinking, you know, what kind of employers are going to be here? And I, you know, I didn't really know what to expect. And then I walked in and I saw the names of some of the biggest, most successful manufacturers, highest paying people in the state of South Carolina who are out there willing to hire to give a second chance, not just because they're good people, they are good people, but they know they get good employees, good employees who've seen the other side of things and know what they have to lose and generally behave themselves and uh, work hard. So without saying anything more about uh, employers, let me introduce Doug Terrell uh, with Blue Cabin Log, the Blue Ridge Log Cabins, right? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you. We're uh, excited to be here this morning and be a part of this. Uh, I was asked to come and speak about our relationship with the uh, Livesay Correctional Facility in Spartanburg. Uh, <clears throat> my name again is Doug Terrell. I'm Vice President of Manufacturing with Blue Ridge Log Cabins. We're a systems built log home builder uh, that produced modular lo solid log constructed homes. And we got involved with Livesay in 2018 uh, as we were starting to build homes on our second production line. Uh, for the South Carolina di disaster relief recovery for flood victims and hurricane victims in the state. And uh, Livesay was able to supply us an immediate need. And uh, I want to thank also George Dodkin, the warden, and his team uh, for creating such a streamlined process. Uh, the hiring process was very simple and easy. We were able to come in and uh, conduct interviews because we do have skilled trades that we're hiring for. And uh, we employed up to 14 people at a time uh, from Livesay. And uh, I'm proud to say that we have uh, employees through that program that we used up until the pandemic uh, that still work for us today that paroled out and came to work for us. We found the workers to be dedicated, uh, hardworking, and uh, they look to accomplish the goals that we set forth in our production facility. And so uh, it's been a great relationship for us and appreciate our time to speak today. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, I'm Antonio Sadler and I'm a formerly incarcerated person. I did 10 years in the South Carolina Department of Corrections. I did five of those years right here at Manning. Uh, I took classes and facilitated classes in this very building, in this classroom. And I can honestly say that, though I couldn't always see it at the time, this place helped me grow as a man and develop as a better human being. There are people in this agency that are in the business of helping people win their battles. Um, we all have a battle. 
every one of us. There are people at SEDC and GTL that are in the business of helping people win their battles. Um, I'm thankful for the time that I got to do here. While I was here, I got to use the tablets for the last year, and the tablets had an immediate positive impact on the prison culture and the prison environment. Uh, it gave us the opportunity to communicate with our family uh, more readily. It gave us access to life skill classes, educational material. It was a changing event for everyone. And now I can say with pride that I'm an employee of GTL Communications Second Chance Program. And we at GTL are happy and proud to be a small part of the initiative to continue to reduce recidivism in this country. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Gilbert Grimble, and I work with Catholic Charities of the Midlands um, through the Diocese of Charleston. And we were blessed to have the opportunity to partner with the Department of Corrections in 2016. Actually, the relationship started just as they started creating the program. But when I came on in 2016, I had the opportunity to work with and meet directly with Nina Walker Staley, who was the then warden of Manning. Uh, that relationship was cemented uh, from a prior relationship that we had, uh, but this was an opportunity for us to come in through Catholic Charities to create a program called Renew and Esther's Journey. Renew provides supports to the men right here at Manning, and Esther's Journey was initiated um, at Camille Grimm, uh, and what our focus was, looking at what was not being done. As you see, great partners. You had great partners already connected to the Department of Corrections to address the need of recidivism. What was not happening wholly was identifying a way to make sure that each man and woman who left these facilities had their own identity. Birth certificates, social security cards, IDs, and making sure they were going into a stable living environment. Homelessness should not be an issue when you leave this kind of environment because then you will recidivate. So Catholic Charities took a very, very focused vision of addressing those basic needs, creating a foundation so you could have your own, each man and woman that we serve would have their own ID in hand, birth certificate or social security card, so they can secure these jobs, so they can get treatment so they can be housed. Because without a basic ID, there is little to nothing that you can accomplish. So we've been blessed to have this relationship ongoing with the Department of Corrections, and we look forward to the continued relationship. Uh, congratulations for the, for the advancement. Congratulations for having that impact on recidivism. And we want to stay connected. So let us know what we can do. Good morning. My name is Sarah Goldsby. I'm the director at the Department of Alcohol and Other Drug Abuse Services. And on behalf of the whole agency, it is such an honor to celebrate today with uh, the Department of Corrections. We have a program with medications and peer support specialists that is probably our favorite program at, at the agency where we have the privilege of working directly with the inmates uh, to train them and to certify them as peer support specialists, folks in long-term recovery from substance use disorders who have a skill set and a professional level uh, to assist others who are ambivalent or uncertain or entering recovery themselves. And this work goes on here at the prison. And so, uh, by the end of this month, uh, we will have over 100 certified peer support specialists. Uh, so it's very exciting. <laughs> About half of those have re-entered the community, and of those, uh, they are employed at our recovery community organizations and addiction treatment uh, agencies around the state. They are highly sought after because of their skill set and their lived experience. 
Um, and along with that, we have been offering and will continue to offer those medications to inmates here who are re-entering the community. When they're medically eligible and when they're interested, we have the medications that help prevent them from returning to drugs and alcohol when they leave the, the prison uh, safety net. And so we just continue uh, to love this work that we get to do with you and looking forward to a bright future. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Dwight James. I'm with Reemerge. Uh, we are a reentry services program sponsored by the U.S. Department of Commerce and the Minority Business Development Agency. I want to thank uh, Diane Sumter, who's somewhere in the room, with DISA Inc., who convinced me to come on board uh, a little more than a year ago to work with this particular effort. It's been life-changing. It's been impactful on over 100 formerly incarcerated citizens. And we're continuing to get referrals through Manning, through Camille, through Lieber, and Kershaw prisons. And we're looking forward to expanding that opportunity in terms of serving returning citizens in South Carolina. With the impact of training programs to help them develop new careers in CDL and, and entrepreneurship, in various fields where they can make a living wage. That makes a difference. And one of the unique aspects of Reemerge's approach has to do with helping to resolve some of the behavioral issues that they deal with. We not only deal with the, or work with the returning citizen, but we also loop into that spectrum the, the family that they have left the close community members that they've left and help them to reintegrate and truly return home. I want to commend the department for the investments that they've made, the commitment, because it does pay off. It pays off for all of us as citizens and all of us as Americans. And we need to roll these kinds of initiatives throughout the state even more strongly and be the example that we're setting for the nation in terms of helping people return home and become productive citizens. I thank you for the opportunity to, to speak this morning briefly and look forward to working with you and many of our partners who are here represented as well, because we couldn't do it alone. The strong ecosystem that's developed over the years is one of the main reasons. And I also want to commend the reentry staff because they've been a lifeline to us. So, yeah. so continue to do the good work. Thank you. God bless you all. Uh, for members of the media, after the governor's finished taking questions, we're going to kind of walk around and see some of the programs and some of the training, and then we're going to make our way outside for a couple more things. Thank you. Any questions for anyone? Yeah, so Ms. Ed Cox. I'll get you that information. Um, I don't have that specifically right now, but I know um, we have a lot more than we did three years ago because of funding from the General Assembly, Governor McMaster's support. We have that two-year program down at, uh, down at Lieber. We have a program at Kershaw. We have a program here at Manning, and then we have a program uh, at Camille for the females. But with our reclassification system, that number is going to expand greatly because people have an opportunity to advance in the system where they don't, but we can get you that number. Yes. What type of uh, skilled trade jobs are the inmates capable of doing once they leave um, Maybe a cameraman for a local news network. Uh, <laughs> um, no, I mean, they can literally do anything. We, we've got welding. We've got plumbing. You're about to see just a small portion. We are, we've got just over 15,000. We've got 15,000, about 537 folks incarcerated here currently. We are a, um, a large town, small city, so everything we do here that you see on the outside, we do on the inside. So you name it, it's available. I want people to hire these folks. Um, I had a plumber one time come to my house and you know, he poured something down my sink because it was stopped up and I said, well, I'm an attorney. I was actually working in private practice at Tompkins and McMaster and I got his bill and I said, well, that's more than I charge an hour. He said, yeah, I used to be an attorney too. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yes, Ms. Hancock. Do you track how many employers uh, hire inmates? 
we do we can get you that information but as uh, mr elsey said you'd be amazed at the the employees across the state just think very big um that hire they're hiring these folks for all sorts of jobs from maintenance to construction to you name it they're hiring them to to do it brian when the state was at 33 percent when you started what, what was the ranking in nationwide how where were we at well that was in 2010 i started in 2013. um so we were i'd say mid-pack um, but we have i think there's a handout that has those numbers that can kind of show you some states have 50 percent recidivism um so it's incredible where we are 21 percent and we're going to go lower with this new system i was going to say what's the goal here are you trying to get it down to zero i mean what's next i mean obviously that's the goal we can do only so much we can put the skills in front of uh folks let them take the classes and let them make the decisions not to return i uh, see we you know we've got director adger here i know triple p is helping with what they can uh, we got hhs here too and they're helping um get folks what they need but what we're going to do here is we're going to knock down barriers we had a lot of barriers one thing that director Schwedo and i worked on there was a fee for getting a, um an id and i'd go around and they'd ask for you know information they'd say hey, i can't afford that that fee i think was fifty dollars um and that might have been might as well have been a million dollars for some folks because they didn't have the money when they left so we knocked that down we're going to knock we're knocking down the housing we're knocking down the stigmatism about hiring folks we're educating employees we get calls all the time. I know the governor does all the time. I need employees. I mean, the, the economy is just humming along here. The unemployment rate is almost, it's one of the lowest in the country, if not the lowest. And these employees want to hire folks, and they know they're going to get good folks who leave corrections because they're going to be prepared. They're going to show up to work. They're going to be ready to work, and they're going to want that second chance. What portion of the prison population has access to this sort of program for all these programs? So anybody right now, the way it works is at Manny or at, at uh, Lieber Correctional, anybody that um, is within two years of leaving, they get it at level three. Six months um, is level two. Six months is here. But we're getting ready to change all that with our new classification system, where they're going to come here for six months um, from just say level one, and then they're going to go to a work camp and have jobs and things of that nature. Level two will go to Kershaw Correctional for six months, and then their last 18 months, they're going to go to a prison industry, which has the lowest recidivism rate of all the things we track, um, and work there and then leave. So anybody that's leaving will have access to these programs. But anybody incarcerated has access to programs. Just because you're not going to leave prison, just say you're doing life, does not mean you cannot affect others. We're working with Vera, where we have mentors who are working with the younger folks, the 18 to 25 year olds, to try to change their track so they don't end up here for life. So if you want a program and you're at the department and you behave and you follow the rules, they're available. Yes, sir. Have you seen any changes to interest in these programs? You were talking about the labor shortage. Has there been a difference from employers in the past few months? Oh, absolutely. I get phone calls all the time. They were desperate for people. I mean, we can't, I know Governor McMaster was, I think, first or second governor in the country to do away with the, the extra federal benefit. Um, and that was the calls I was getting was, hey, we need people, we need people, we need people. I said, okay, we're getting ready to let them go. And today, I think, I think today, is today the 12th? Today was the day that they started, or yesterday maybe, was the day that they started showing up to um, um, employees outside. And then we're gonna continue to grow that with our new reclassification system. Brian, how important is reaching this goal to be invested in the country to you personally? I mean, you know South Carolina's prison system, uh, you know, reputation over the past 30 or 40 years. How big of a deal is this for you? Um, it's something personally for me. Um, my family's been in law enforcement in this country for well over 100 years. I know the importance of returning people safely. When I go and talk to um, rotaries or other people, the way I sell this to folks is, who do you want sitting next to your loved one? Do you want someone that has mental health treatment, that has a job, is connected with their family? Do you want someone that has um, stable housing, sit next to your loved one at the bus stop or at the restaurant or at the library? Or do you want someone who doesn't know where their next meal is gonna come from, doesn't have their mental health, um, you know, they're not receiving treatment. They don't have housing, they don't have a job, they have no future and no hope. And that's kind of a simple, simple thing. When people think of it that way, they say, you know what, I want the first person who has a career, has a path, has a place to stay. Um, you know, I don't know if it's my Catholic faith that kind of brings that out or not, but it's something that's very, very important to me. And I think it's important. I know it's important to all the folks, but we have all our wardens here. We have all our staff around. You see all the people here. This is a lot of people from the Department of Corrections um, who are here to support this. And we do this every single day, but we do it behind the fence. You don't necessarily see 
it, that's why it's so important to showcase what we're doing. But it is immensely important to me as a, as a dad and a husband to make sure my community is safe, to make sure my state is safe. And that's what we're doing every single day. So currently the VERA program is at um, Turbyville and Lee Correctional, and we have folks that are incarcerated that are older that are at those programs we have um, through VERA, and we announced this a couple of years ago. So they are incarcerated folks who are probably doing a lot more time. But, you know, I can go and talk to these folks, some of these, and say, hey, you should do the following, and they're going to say, you didn't come up like me, you don't, you don't know. It's kind of a, um, not necessarily a peer thing, but I've been there, here are my mistakes, this is what you shouldn't do. We're involving their families. We're doing everything we can to make sure that folks return successfully. We've got clothing closets. Um, again, I was appalled at what I saw with people leaving in our uniforms. As a state, we can do better. As we know, when we drive around South Carolina, we see church steeples everywhere. Charleston's called the holy city for a reason. Greenville, you know, we have a lot of um, churches up there. The churches are involved, but I think this is what the citizens of South Carolina would want, is when folks return, they return successfully and safely. Talk a little bit about what this means for a community to have these guys reintegrated into society and being productive, not back on the streets committing more crime and having hope. So, I mean, I can start from a law enforcement perspective. There's not going to be as many interactions. Then you go to the courts. There's not going to be that court time, that court money. And then coming back to prison, as I said, if it was every point is 92 um, a year, so, you know, 11 years or so, we're at another prison. Think of having a family member just disappear for four or five years. Our, our average sentence, I think, is 4.9 years. So on a more granular level, I see it with my children. They'll be home to um, read to their kids. They'll be home to mentor their kids. They'll be home to take care of their families. That means that that generation then will go out and do the right thing as opposed to, you know, maybe having an absent parent, which we see. And we try to connect them as much as you can, but there's nothing like being there in person to try to raise um, your, your children and raise your family. And then it goes to the community where the community is safer, where people are paying taxes. They're working hard. They're, um, you know, paying for their debt to society, uh, and they're done doing that, and then they're just going to be productive members of society. I'm not sure I can capture in words how important it is to return someone safely. There's just so many aspects, and it just touches so many things in society. Can you talk briefly about what the money from the General Assembly actually did? I mean, it went to specifically. I can, but I'm smart enough to know the governor wants to say something, so I'm going to let him talk. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry actually had a director of probation, pardon, and parole has an answer to someone's question a little while ago to amplify what Reverend Sterling said. Well, I'm not sure about the question, but I can tell you I want to congratulate Brian Sterling and all of the leadership here at SCDC. Let me just say this. At Triple P, we're, we're joined at the hips. Uh, when I came on board, I realized, and there was this discussion about getting people out of the prison system, and I immediately started talking about what does that does, do for us in terms of supervision. And so as we reduce the prison population, we immediately start to raise the thoughts about how do we supervise folks that are coming out of the system? How do we make sure that our agents are prepared to make sure that they don't recidivate? So in Triple P, we're doing everything that we can to make sure that these numbers continue in the right direction. Because at the end of the day, my supervision agents have to be trained to know what to do and how to meet people where they are. So what we're doing at Triple P to make sure that this continue is that we're looking at specialized caseloads. We're looking at training people on mental health, training people on anger management, training people on how to make the right referrals so that the folks that are coming out, their needs are being met, and we just don't have somebody on our uh, caseload that we're just trying to get off of, that we're actually making immediate impact and, and making sure that we prepare folks to be productive citizens. So I'm not sure if that answers the question, but I'm not going anywhere, and I'll certainly answer any question that you have. Thank you. Thank you. So the 4.17 or 4.19, I mean, if you think about it, we're able to open up the two-year reentry program for our, our maximum security folks. And that, those are our most challenging folks. Obviously, they've been out of society for a long time. Um, they've, create, they've committed serious crimes. Um, so their return to society can be challenging with skills and connections with family and families die or they move on or what have you. So we use that money for that. We use the money also. Um, here for Manning, Kershaw, and elsewhere, we'd not be able to do this without, if you look at the, 
the investment that the General Assembly and the Governor McMaster has made in returning citizens, it's 4.1, just by 92 people not coming back to prison, that's a $6 million savings just that year. And if you expand it out, um, it's almost $72 million in savings with just that little investment. If I um, Do you have a request to the legislature for what you could, how you could expand that further? We always have requests for the legislature. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Uh, one last question for me. Yes. Once an individual has successfully uh, entered the program and you know, got a job, do you guys keep track of them later on down the road? So Director Elsey uh, mentioned that number. I think it was 72%. 71% 70, success, right. success rate through the Manning program, and we are tracking others also. But the biggest um, indicator is our recidivism rate, which is you know the lowest in the country. So um, that's to that's add on to that, when they leave, they all have an assigned person within our agency that stays in touch with them, works, helps them work through problems, and helps them find other employment if and if I could so choose. just so tell, we, go ahead, sorry, go ahead. So, so we do stay in touch. And we have a person at DMV that does the same thing. We had an, uh, a thing that sticks in my mind where Ms. Staley, people that were incarcerated used to not be able to come back and call us for help. And it just didn't make much sense to me. So we are still a resource for them. We had a guy at DMV who he was having a, a moment as um, sometimes we can at DMV. Um, no way. <laughs> no way. <laughs> And, um, you know, he was, he was on parole um, or he was on probation, uh, just left prison. And if he had an interaction with law enforcement, he probably would have come back to prison. But his sister called Miss Staley, and, and we called headquarters at DMV, and they said, okay, go to window number seven. He couldn't get his ID. Um, and this was before we were working with them to get it before they left. He went to window number seven. I'm making up a number here. And there was someone that specialized in helping folks that had been incarcerated. And she simply said, this is just a simple thing. Do you have the following documents? Yes, I do. Okay, the other person didn't tell me that, but I do. Here's your ID, you can go home. That person probably would have had an incident, ended up back in court, ended up back in prison. Someone may have gotten hurt in the incident, and now, you know, they're, they're set. It's just simple things like that, just things that just make sense. Clothes, housing, jobs, a little bit of help, and they're not gonna return to prison. Violent crime has been a huge discussion recently. What role would you play, say, So if we weren't doing this, think how much higher it would be if we weren't setting these people up for success. I can't imagine what the number would be. And you know, this is across the country, so we're measured um, against other states. But teaching people anger management, uh, what Sarah's doing at Deodis with, with the drug addiction, because you know, we know the drug addiction leads to other crimes, property crimes and violent crimes and things of that nature. So um, I can't even guess or put a number on what it's doing, but I know it is impactful. And I think we want to start walking around. Any we more could, questions? We could go on all day. This, is, this shows what collaboration, communication, cooperation can do and shows how South Carolina is on the way up.